I want to ask you to imagine something with me. Imagine that you are Susie. Susie is stressed. Susie's home is in a desperate situation. It's Susie, her husband, her three kids. The house they have is not that big, but they've managed to get by with the space they have. But about a year and a half or two ago, Susie's parents moved in with them, her recently retired parents. They're still very vigorous, quite active. They still are now working again. They hadn't been. Because, you see, Susie's parents met someone at the church they attend. He was the teacher of a Bible class. They enjoyed his teaching. They learned from it. He was also a financial analyst and investor. They invested their retirement savings, all of their retirement savings, with him. He is now, well, we're not sure where he is now, Susie would tell you. Some country that doesn't have an extradition treaty with the U.S., apparently, gone with my parents and many others' retirement monies. So now we're all cramped into this space trying to figure out how we're going to make it. Imagine you're Susie. What would you want? What would you want with the man who took their money? Or imagine you're Johnny. Johnny was bullied when he grew up, bullied consistently. His tormentor always seemed to be there throughout his grade school years, throughout his high school years. The bullying left a deep imprint on Johnny's soul. Even to this day, as an adult, he still struggles with being sure of himself, being able to have confidence that he can do what is required of him. There's always this inner voice telling him there's something wrong with him, something defective about him. Johnny's tormentor also grew up. Grew up to pursue studies, to become a successful attorney. Grew up to be an elder at his local church, a spiritual leader. Johnny's tormentor has never mentioned what happened in grade school and high school. Imagine you're Johnny. What do you want? What would you desire about that tormentor? Or finally, even imagine your Jim or especially Mary. Jim and Mary, a happily married couple by all accounts. Sure, life is life, but they did well together. And then somebody took a drink and took a drive. The fiery crash ended Mary's brother's life. Mary and her brother had always been close. So the pain was searing. Stabbing. But what made the pain even worse was that the drunk driver walked away with, well, with very few injuries. Of course, the slap on the wrist he got probably hurt for a few minutes. But that was it. Now, you're Mary, or Jim, her husband. What do you want? for the drunk driver. There come those moments when you just want to know that somebody is at your side and somebody is for you. Somebody is going to prosecute this in some way. We've been in a series on the Holy Spirit, not the Holy Spirit generally speaking throughout Scripture, but specifically what Jesus had to say about the Holy Spirit in those final hours of his life on earth. This is our third and final study. Our first one, the Helper, told us that the Holy Spirit brings us the power of Jesus. He will help you. And brings us the presence of Jesus. He'll be with you. The second one, the witness, answered the question, how do I know if I have the Holy Spirit? When your life is focused on Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit. And when you have the Holy Spirit, your life will focus on others. And now we come to the third statement. John's Gospel, the 16th chapter. 
But before we turn and read verses from that passage, I want to put on the table before us the words of a New Testament scholar named Grant Osborne. Osborne writes about this passage that we will read. So consider these words as a backdrop for what we will study today. Osborne writes this. The Spirit is a prosecuting attorney here in John 16, presenting irrefutable evidence of the guilt of the world before God. However, this is not the final judgment, for the Spirit is not standing before God on His judgment seat, but is convicting the people of the world in their own hearts so as to bring them to repentance. This is the primary area in which the Spirit works as an advocate, bringing His convicting presence to bear on the unsaved. It is the courtroom of the mind where the Spirit performs His convicting work. So bear Osborne's words in mind. The Spirit is a prosecutor here. He is prosecuting, but his prosecution is taking place in the courtroom of the mind. If your name happens to be Susie or Johnny or Jim or Mary, you have a prosecutor at your side. And this prosecutor is going after those who have caused you harm. But if you happen to be a financial wheeler dealer or a tormentor, or a drunk driver, the Spirit is after you not to punish, but to save. So let's turn to John chapter 16. You'll notice that the first verses we'll read have to do with Jesus promising the presence of the Holy Spirit. John 16, beginning with verse 5, But now I'm going away to the one who sent me, and not one of you is asking me where I'm going. Instead, you grieve because of what I've told you. But in fact, it is best for you that I go away, because if I don't, the advocate won't come. If I do go away, then I will send him to you. It's his promise. In just a bit here, he doesn't say it precisely this way, but in just a few hours, I will disappear from your sight. And then a few weeks after that, resurrected, I will ascend to the Father. I will be gone, but I will send you the Advocate to be with you, bring you power, change your life. Now, there is much said in this book about what the Holy Spirit does. But I want you to notice specifically in this passage what the focus of the Holy Spirit's work will be, because that's in the next verse, John 16 and verse 8. And when He comes, He will convict the world of its sin and of God's righteousness and of the coming judgment. Now, it is true that the Spirit comes into our lives to convince us of our need for Jesus. It is true that the Spirit comes to comfort us in our loss, that the Spirit comes as a down payment on the glory that we will later experience, and for many other reasons as well, all detailed in this book. But in this passage, the Spirit is not focused on any of that Rather, he says, he will come to convict the world. Cosmos in Greek. The world. That's an important word here in the Gospel of John. Because in the Gospel of John, it typically means the world in all of its systems of organization that stand in opposition to God, the world that has pushed God out of the picture, the world that is in rebellion against God. Cosmos. The word is used at other times in John's Gospel. One time especially memorably. It happens in the context of a nighttime garden conversation when a well-known Jewish rabbi sits knee-to-knee 
with a well-known itinerant preacher. And the words linger in the air. For God so loved the cosmos, the world. In all of its love, ugliness, in all of its languor, in all of its rebellion, in all of its racism and sexism and violence and division, in all of its death, God so loved the world, cosmos. In fact, he loved it so much that here before Jesus leaves, Jesus says, I will send you the advocate as a prosecutor to convict that same world of its sin, to convict it, because I love it too much to leave it as it is. So Jesus tells us there in verse 8, this is what the Spirit, the advocate, will do. He will convict the world. And then he gives three areas of sin, of righteousness, of judgment. He'll unpack a little bit more those three areas in the next three verses. Back to John 16, starting with verse 9. The world's sin is that it refuses to believe in me. Righteousness is available because I go to the Father and you will see me no more. Judgment will come because the ruler of this world has already been judged. So let's take those one at a time. Convict the world of its sin. What is sin? One person who's read Scripture says, well, sin is a transgression of the law. Well, yes. But is there more to it? What is sin? Well, sin is brokenness and despair. It's a departure from the will of God. Yes, that's true. But is there more? What is sin? And then I think of the very pragmatic definition of sin I've shared with you before came from one of my marriage and family therapy supervisors who said sin is the attempt to meet the legitimate need of the heart in a way that won't work. It's the attempt to meet the legitimate need of the heart in a way that won't work. Pragmatic. But none of those answers the question of what sin is in John's gospel. In John's gospel, sin is a refusal to place one's belief and faith and trust in Jesus. Now follow this. In John's Gospel, we're told that Jesus is our Creator. Third verse of the Gospel. Nothing without Him was made. He was involved in everything that was made. Which means that He wove us together. He knit us together into the fabric of our life. He intertwined the threads of beauty, of desire for God, of a yearning to connect with others. He designed us in a way that is most completely fulfilled when we place our lives in His hands. St. Augustine was right from so many centuries ago when he penned the words, our souls are restless. Restless. Until they find their rest in Thee. That's the picture of the Gospel of John. And so in John, when Jesus talks about sin, he's saying, people who will not accept and believe and place their trust in me, that's a broken relationship, and it prohibits them from living to be all that I have designed them to be. So how does that sin make itself manifest? It makes itself manifest by pulling in, by drawing in, by becoming concerned only about me. My needs, my desires, my wishes, my fantasies, my dreams. Me, me, me. So if I can bilk you out of money, Susie, I'll do it because that will line my pockets and provide for my future. It doesn't matter how much I hurt you. So if your name is Susie, know that Jesus 
sent the advocate, sent the prosecutor to go to work on that person's heart and life, to go after them, to afflict them, to bang on the door, to pursue them, relentlessly, consistently, persistently pursue them, trying to draw them back to that kind of belief and acceptance of Jesus, which will then allow them to live the abundant life of engaging with others in deeply meaningful ways. The prosecutor, Susie, is on your side, convicting that person. Will they hear the voice? Some of you read the Chronicles of Narnia to your kids when they were growing up. Some of you kiddos are reading them right now. You may remember Uncle Andrew. Uncle Andrew did not want to hear the song of Aslan. If you're part of the uninitiated, Aslan is the lion, the Christ figure in the Chronicles. And Aslan had a song. He sang the world into being. But Uncle Andrew didn't want to hear the song. Closed his eyes, his minds, his ears to it. He didn't want to hear it, didn't want anything to do with it. And yet the lion continued with that deep, resonant tone to sing the world into being. The moment came when Aslan said, Narnia, awake! And all of creation awoke to the song of the lion. But by now, Uncle Andrew had turned his mind and his ears so far away that all he could hear were deep growls and threatening roars that pushed him away. Susie, that wheeler dealer, he's hearing the roar. Just pray that he'll begin to hear the music. Because, Susie, you have a prosecutor on your side. He will convict, Jesus said, the world of its sin, convict it of righteousness righteousness convicted of what it means to live a truly righteous life what does that mean here in the gospel of John that's the second reality well very simply remember the context as Jesus is speaking these words the pounding of the Roman guards feet on the pavement is echoing the sawing and hammering of the cross can be heard the shuffling of a thousand pilgrims' feet that on the morrow will pursue him to Calvary can be heard in the background. The world is about to condemn him to say, we want nothing to do with you. The Roman Empire will, will say, you're a revolutionary. The religious leadership will say, you're a heretic. Be done with him. But within hours, God will vindicate him, raise him to life, Raise him in righteousness to a new life that is symbolic of the life that every disciple of his has at their beck and call. It's living the new life which God has always desired his people to live. What does that new life look like in John? In John's gospel, it looks like a life of abundance. I have come that they might have life, Jesus says in John 10, and that they might have it in abundance. And that life is abundant. Why? Because throughout John's gospel, as well as throughout John's epistles, there is a word that occurs and reoccurs time and time again as descriptive the kind of righteous life Jesus calls us to live. And it's the word agape. Love. Deep. Other-centered. 
self-sacrificing love. That's the righteousness to which he calls us. If you are acting out of the ethic of God's kind of love, you are living the righteous life. So if your name happens to be Johnny and you have known the pain, the enduring agony, the soul-sapping, soul-searing sorrow that comes from abuse and being bullied, you have a prosecutor at your side You have a prosecutor who stands for you, who stands with you, who has not forgotten you, and is going after that tormentor with every bit of holy power that the Trinity can muster. Going after him, not to squash him, to punish him, but to bring him to his knees in repentance so that at one point he will bow before God and will grip your hand, Johnny, and embrace you and say, I am more sorry than I could ever articulate because that prosecutor got to me, showed me the reality of what I have done. The year was 1906. It was a tragic year. It was a triumphant year. I want to read to you the words of the the writer, the author, Rich Nathan, as he writes about two very polarized realities that unfolded around that time in 1906. Here are Rich Nathan's words. In the decade prior to 1906, Lynchings of African Americans in America had skyrocketed. It is estimated that well over 1,000 blacks, mainly men, were lynched, hanged, shot, or sometimes buried alive in the United States. Millions of people in the United States had joined the Ku Klux Klan. In 1906, same year, The Spirit of God was poured out in a powerful revival in Los Angeles that has come to be known as the Azusa Street Revival. Under the leadership of an African-American man, William Seymour, tens of thousands of people from all over the world and all walks of life, rich, poor, men, women, Americans, non-Americans, black, white, Asian, Latino, came by car, by horse and buggy, by train and by boat. They all encountered the Spirit. In a year of lynchings, blacks and whites were embracing each other as beloved brothers and sisters in Christ. Frank Bartleman, a historian of the Azusa Street Revival, said, the color line is washed away by the blood of Jesus Christ. Could that be the answer? Could it be that simple? that the prosecutor comes after those tormentors of the world, comes after them with all the force, the power, and the energy of heaven until every barrier is broken down, every heart is broken, every prejudice is vanished and vanquished. And there they are, the people of God white, black, Asian, Hispanic, men, women, boys, girls, everyone washed, cleansed, living the life of righteousness, of love. So if your name is Johnny, That prosecutor is at your side fighting for you. God has not forgotten. Jesus says he will convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and thirdly, 
of coming judgment. It's curious because in John's gospel, judgment has to do with how we respond to Jesus. Judgment happened at the cross. So it's curious here that Jesus appears to be dipping deeper into the future, coming judgment, not just what's coming tomorrow, but even beyond it. Coming judgment. After all, what would it be to inhabit a world where there is no hope that what is wrong today will ever get righted tomorrow? Who would want to live in that world? A world where there is not a sense that God will balance the scales of justice. We want to occupy a, word, a world that reflects the words of Martin Luther King Jr., who drawing on the images of an earlier African-American preacher said, the arc of history is long, but it bends toward Justice. Coming judgment, Jesus says. That prosecutor stands by your side, Mary and Jim, stands by your side saying, I'm going after that drunk driver. Right now I'm going after that drunk driver to bring that person to a searing repentance profound repentance because if not there is a judgment day that will come we've often thought judgment is bad news we've read of judgment many times in scripture and thought that's a bad term nothing could be further from the truth not if your name is Jim or Mary or Susie or Johnny Judgment is good news, as it is in Scripture time and again, because judgment is given in favor of God's people. John in Revelation writes of the souls under the altar that cry out for vindication. How long, O Lord, how long until you vindicate us? Coming judgment, Jesus says. The prosecutor will let him know. Because we need judgment. Otherwise, what would you say to the one and a half to two million Cambodians experience the killing fields of the Khmer Rouge and Pol Pot? What would you say to the six million Jews of Hitler's Europe? What would you say to the 20 million 20 million, some estimate as high as 60 million, who were eliminated from Stalin's Russia. Judgment will come, Jesus says. But if the drunk driver will listen, it can come now in the form of repentance. The movie is out now. The book is always better. It was for me. I read it years ago, year, decades ago. The House on Garibaldi Street. The story of the Mossad, the Israeli secret service, secreting Adolf Eichmann, the architect of the killing of six million Jews, secreted him out of Argentina, took him back to Israel where he stood trial and was executed for his war crimes. Maybe the most gripping part of the book is the reaction, the response of those Israeli Mossad agents when they finally had Eichmann under their control and they were finally able to see him, to confront him. The response, one after another, was almost universal. Instead of this towering figure of hatred and fear, wearing the Nazi uniform. One Israeli agent after another looked at him and said, Is this the man? This? 
this miserable runt quivering with fear? Is this the man from whom our hearts ran cold with terror? This? This? He is nothing. Jesus says judgment will come. And for every child of his who has cowered in fear at the threat of someone else whose heart has been ripped to pieces at the violence of someone else whose life has been destroyed because of the racism, the prejudice of someone else. Jesus says, you've got a prosecutor by your side. That prosecutor is going after those people, hopefully to save them. Because in that same passage, you remember when, when the word cosmos was used before, for God so loved the cosmos? Just after that verse comes verse 17. Where Jesus says, not only for God so loved the world that he gave, but he then goes on to say, I did not come into the world to condemn the world, but to save it. So while your prosecutor works on those hearts, those lives, those minds, Susie and Johnny and Jim and Mary, He's working on them to bring them in repentance before God and before you if they will allow it. But whether they allow it or not, judgment day will come. And when it comes, God will balance the scales and God will take you by the hand and he will say, your suffering is done. Welcome home, child. Welcome home.